Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Steven de Haas and as the Dean of Antwerp Management School and on behalf of all our staff and partners, I would like to welcome you to this virtual roundtable on sustainable value creation. This virtual roundtable is co-organized by Antwerp Management School and the Academy of Business in Society and with full support of our business partners, the Port of Antwerp, BASF and Randstad. We are all very happy to have you here in this call. In the first place, we do of course hope that you are all healthy and safe and we wish all of you, your family and your organizations all the best in these strange Corona times. In the light of these strange times and crisis and its far-reaching consequences, it is great that we are joining today together on a reflection and discussion on sustainable business value and transformation in society. More than ever, this is the time to put this topic on all our agendas. It is clear that sustainable transformation entails a deep and systemic systemic transformation of entire value change. But such a deep transformation unlikely will happen suddenly. Many voices are calling for an urgent need on this, as for example also recently in the World Economic Forum revised manifesto in, the, in Davos for 2020. And while a sustainable transformation is underway, still challenges and resistances do remain. To address these challenges, various models have been developed by academic experts and businesses. And it is clear that understanding in a critical and thoughtful way these existing theories and concepts will be important for the further development and adoption of sustainable value creation approaches. And for that reason, and again, we are pleased to have you here and participate in this live streamed fully online value creation roundtable. I think this roundtable is a unique moment for all of us to exchange knowledge among thought leaders and practitioners and that we can from that moment on reconceive business value to society. With these, with these insights, let's work together towards a stronger society for the future. I would like now to give the floor to Professor, my colleague Professor Wayne Visser of Antwerp Management School and Ivo Master of ABIS to also welcome you introduce everyone in this call and walk you through the agenda. I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. The floor is yours, Wayne. Eva is up next. Thank you. Uh, hello all, my name is uh, Ivo Matza. I'm the CEO of uh, ABIS, the Academy of Business in Society in Brussels. And uh, I also thank you for the participation of this uh, co-created uh, event, this uh, round table. Uh, we are very grateful to work together with our colleagues from uh, Antwerp Management School. And it's quite an honor to do this, uh, to organize this uh, uh, together. Um, as uh, Stephen already uh, mentioned, it was, uh, we organized this round table. <clears throat> and I remember the first time that we talked about this, uh, organizing round table is that there, will, there should be a limited number of people because it's a round table and uh, the good thing in the crisis is uh, you go digital and then suddenly you have a much larger audience and uh, uh, of course there are many problems in this crisis but i think we organize now an event with a lower footprint <clears throat> uh, we can host uh, panelists from all over all over the world and um, we reach more people. So um, uh, I think we all are uh, you know, have a kind of problems in this uh, first Corona and later economic crisis, but I think it has also a few things to learn from that we also can do this uh, effectively online. Um, and I totally agree um, with Stephen that uh, uh, the sense of urgency to think in sustainable value I think is, has never been that clear as before, as today. And um, uh, I, I remember uh, some years ago, I think it was in 2009, that we had a project at uh, ABIS about uh, financial and non-financial indicators for creating value. 
And then the value was more or less the customer value. And I'm very happy to hear today that there are much more stakeholder or holistic views on, on value or value creation. Um, the, and, and the fact that we are met with so many people here, I think is a very good and strong signal and um, uh, that we are in this corona crisis aware that uh, the urgency to create sustainable value is quite high. And I think it would be, it would be good that I think it's in our own hands, all of us, to accelerate this transformation and not to and not to slow down. Uh, I hope you have a very inspiring uh, uh, event, uh, um, and let's uh, let's continue with the speech from Wayne. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ivo, and welcome everyone. I'm really pleased that you could join us, and people will be trickling in. I realize, uh, especially in the lead up to us kicking off the first session at the top of the hour. And so what I would like to do uh, is first briefly introduce myself. Um, I will introduce uh, all of the panelists at the start of the uh, first session, which will be uh, at the top of the hour. Uh, but before that, I thought it might be useful also to give a little reflection on what is it, probably a much longer journey that we've been on around the uh, debate on value creation than most people would realize. Um, I'm often rather amused when I get young students who, who come with an enthusiasm for the topic because they really discover it as something new. And of course, it's, it's not new at all. So I'd like to start with that. Firstly, uh, who am I? Well, um, I work uh, variously as a strategy analyst, a sustainability advisor, a CSR expert, uh, made a couple of documentaries. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough uh, that this career, which wasn't a career when I started, uh, became a full-time career in working on sustainable business and uh, has given me opportunities to work in 77 countries now. Um, I'm currently serving as Professor of Integrated Value at Antwerp Management School, where uh, I also hold the Chair in Sustainable Transformation, which is supported by BASF, Port of Antwerp and Randstad. Um, I'm also Head Tutor and Fellow at the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership and Director of my own uh, think tank company, uh, Kaleidoscope Futures. And I founded CSI International a number of years ago. Uh, before all of that, I was Director of Sustainability Services at KPMG and Strategy Analyst for Capgemini in South Africa. And along the way, I've written 37 books. Um, as we get going, I just want to tell you that if you're on social media and you want to share what you're hearing, we're using the hashtag Value Creation Roundtable. And so you're welcome to uh, tweet and to post as we go. So what about where we've come from? Um, I do think it's good to put this in a, in a historical context. And um, when we think about the role of business in society, if you purely were to look at philanthropy, of course, you can go back thousands of years, uh, all the way back to Hindu scripts like the Upanishads and, and others. I mean, this idea of being ethical, uh, behaving, properly in a market system is not new at all. And we have instances of charity and philanthropy really through our recorded history. So that idea is not new at all. Um, if we start to look at when it became more institutionalized, of course, we can go back at least to the 1870s. Uh, if you look at figures like uh, Carnegie or indeed Rockefeller, uh, who really started to take all of the wealth that they created and share it rather generously, normally towards the end of their life. And what's interesting about that model of philanthropy as it got introduced was that we didn't question so much how those great leaders made their money so long as they were generous with it at the end of their life. So in the case of Rockefeller, he was the richest man in the world at the time and towards the end of his life gave away more than 95% of his wealth. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation still exists today. But when you analyze his life, in fact, he, let's just say, had some questionable business activities. I mean, he was uh, 
very aggressive in the market. At one point, he drove uh, 23 of his 26 competitors out of business within four months in something called the Cleveland Massacre. Um, he was in and out of court the whole of his life. Uh, he was involved in price fixing, collusion, cartels, uh, you name it. So that's an interesting perspective that this idea that yes, uh, we can be philanthropic, but don't think about how we made our money uh, is already one to question. Then what, what seemed to happen is uh, past the turn of the century in the early 1900s, business really uh, started thinking uh, and we start to see the first instances of what we now would call corporate social responsibility appearing on the books of companies. So uh, you get uh, Macy's of New York already in the 1880s uh, showing uh, donations that they've made to an orphanage and putting that as, an, as a donation expense on their books. You get some interesting court cases emerging. So uh, in the case of um, West Cork Railroads, uh, there was a case where uh, they had to lay off a lot of their, their, their workers and they thought that a very responsible thing to do would be to pay them some compensation to help them get back on their feet. And the shareholders took them to court. And the reason was they said that, uh, you know, this is not in the ongoing interest of the company. And in fact, the court ruled in the shareholders' favor. At the same time, uh, roughly also in the 1880s, uh, Steinway got taken to court, the piano manufacturer, for doing something quite similar, but in this case for spending money on their current uh, set of employees, uh, hospitals, clinics, education facilities, and so on. And in this case, the court upheld that that was fine because it was something that could promote the productivity of the workers and therefore be in the interest of the shareholders. So that shareholder value debate has been going on much longer than we think. By the early 1900s, uh, many companies figured out they weren't so good at charities themselves, so they they started partnering with, with the big charities uh, in the world. And then we really started seeing the intellectual foundations of this movement, I think, emerging. So the first uh, books on, on social responsibility coming out um, around 1938, uh, the first book with social responsibility in the, in the title, Ed Bowen, uh, in 1952, I think. Um, and then we started seeing the intellectual leadership really emerging and some of that is in the room today. But uh, if, if we look at some of the early forerunners of that, uh, people like Rachel Carson, who kicked off the environmental movement with her critique of uh, the chemical industry, especially, and her book, Silent Spring. We get people like Ralph Nader, um, who was probably much more successful as an activist, uh, taking on first uh, General Motors and the auto industry, but then many ethical issues subsequently. More successful at that, I think, than running for US president, which he did a few times as well. Um, and then we start to kick into people like Archie Carroll, uh, certainly on corporate social responsibility, the academics really starting to weigh in and, and make sense of this. And what I think we saw was uh, in the 1960s and 70s, especially still a focus on shareholder value uh, with Milton Friedman, of course. Um, but really the, the issues of ethics started to creep onto the agenda. And, and then uh, the agenda has built ever since. And I'm going to stop it there because I think that's enough of a, a long history. I expect that our panelists in the room today will give us uh, something more of a recent history of the evolution of thinking on this. So to those who have just uh, joined for the top of the hour, welcome. Uh, we're now kicking off the first session of our round table on value creation. Um, there are uh, around about 165 of you participating. Thank you for being here. We encourage you throughout this uh, call to use the chat function. Hopefully you can find that and post your comments because we are going to be inviting uh, Jan Boehner, who's uh, on the call here and Carolina, uh, to feedback what you're saying on the chat. So please do make your comments. And just to make sure that the chat is working fine, um, before we introduce uh, our round of panelists, I'd like you just to type in the chat, what is the city and the country uh, that you're calling in from today? And hopefully we should see that start to stream. And uh, 
as panelists as well, this will give us an idea of where people are from. Quite a lot from Belgium, but I saw uh, Japan flash by, uh, certainly some from Germany, from the US, from South Africa, India, um, Buenos Aires, that's good. Uh, Lebanon, Switzerland, uh, uh, Italy. So uh, wonderful. Please keep uh, using the chat as we go. We have a diverse audience and your main way to interact with us today is via the chat. Um, so let me first then introduce who we have with us today on the panel. Um, in the order in which we are going to uh, have them speak, uh, we have Professor uh, Robert Phillips. Uh, you can wave uh, when I introduce you, who's the George R. Gardner Professor in Business Ethics at Schulich School of Business and he will be talking about stakeholder value and I will be introducing each of you in a bit more detail just before you speak. We have uh, Professor Jed Emerson, founder of Blended Value Group and an independent strategic advisor to impact investors. Welcome Jed, he will be talking about blended value. We have Professor Stuart Hart, who's the Stephen Grossman Distinguished Fellow in Sustainable Innovation at the University of Vermont Grossman School of Business and Stuart will be talking about sustainable value. We have Mark Kramer, co-founder and managing director of FSG and a faculty member at Harvard Business School, who will be talking about shared value. And I'll be saying a little bit about uh, integrated value as well. So just before I introduce uh, Robert Phillips in a little bit more detail, I'd like to launch a poll and ask you to what extent do you believe that companies have moved beyond the shareholder value model of business? So if that's working correctly, you should have the poll having popped up. And so I'll just give you a few minutes to vote on that while I introduce our first panelist in a little bit more detail, and that is Robert Phillips. So once again, welcome Robert. Um, as I said, you're the George Gardner Professor in Business Ethics and a Professor of Strategic Management at the York University's Schulich School of Business. You're the author of uh, Stakeholder Theory and Organizational Ethics. Your other research interests include Stakeholder Theory, the History of Corporate Responsibility, Ethics and Networks. And you're affiliated with the Center of Excellence in Responsible Business at Schulich and a senior fellow at the Olson Center for Applied Ethics at the Darden School, and a past president of the Society for Business Ethics. You're also consulting editor at the Journal of Business Ethics. So welcome. I'm going to end the poll there and we'll share the results. And so it does look like only uh, somewhat a little or not at all. So very few people, uh, roughly 11%, think that uh, we have moved beyond the shareholder value model for business. So that's probably a good way to queue you up. Um, so tell us, Robert, uh, stakeholder value, uh, where does the concept come from? What does it mean? And uh, how did you get involved with it? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Wayne, for having me. I assume everyone can hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so thank you for uh, organizing and arranging this, and uh, hello to everyone out there. Um, uh, I was told that perhaps I was first because uh, stakeholder theory was uh, the older. Uh, wait a minute, clear this off. Uh, was uh, one of the older uh, of the of the theories offered here today, um, and and I did have the uh, great pleasure of working with and co-authoring with Ed Freeman, who I suppose is taken by most to be the uh, uh, the godfather of stakeholder theory, though he cringes each time we say this. Um, but the uh, most highly cited journal article is where I want to start off today. This is Donaldson and Preston and their famous uh, uh, three-part uh, trichotomy of instrumental, descriptive, and normative stakeholder theory. Uh, so descriptive is just merely describing more or less scientifically how managers treat stakeholders. Instrumental uh, is treating stakeholders uh, in a particular way with a given end, typically something like either profit or shareholder wealth maximization. 
uh, in mind and the normative stakeholder theory uh, explicitly uh, involves and engages with ideas from uh, moral theory and ethics. Interestingly, it's often taken as a tripartite distinction, uh, even though it is, in fact, there's four bits, and, and it's often under, uh, under examined what it means when Donaldson and Preston take the fourth leg of their table to be that stakeholder theory is managerial. And, and it's, uh, it's always been remarkable to me that we haven't unpacked that more. I, I've done a little bit of thinking about it, uh, but part of what it must mean is that stakeholder theory is less uh, emphasizing of things like philanthropy, of things like the macroeconomic uh, political economy policy. Of course, these things impact on, uh, on how we manage our stakeholder relationships, uh, but, but it's not the, the core interest of a managerial stakeholder theory. I bring this up because, uh, uh, because even though as a non-epidemiologist, I have very little to say about when we're going to open up the rest of the world and this sort of thing, I trust the experts for that. What I do know is that there are stakeholder decisions being made all around the world right now by managers. And these are very difficult decisions uh, that they are making. Uh, it's often been said that uh, shareholder wealth maximization and stakeholder uh, theory more or less look like the same thing. If you're, if you're managing your stakeholder relationships for these instrumental shareholder wealth maximization purposes, very often you're just going to have to treat people well for these instrumental reasons. With that said, there are times when these theories do in fact diverge. And I think that uh, moments like this crisis are precisely the acid test uh, that, that we uh, would be looking for to see which one was really going on behind the curtains between shareholder or profit maximization or, or true uh, authentic stakeholder relationship uh, optimization. Um, so another concern that many have with stakeholder theory is that it doesn't give a, a single objective function um, and, and that we often have to make trade-offs and that stakeholder theory is unable to tell us exactly as managers how to make these trade-offs. Uh, one thing that stakeholder theory emphasizes, uh, particularly recently, is that skipping to trade-offs too early is, uh, is a default practice. It's, it's mildly hackish, right? And that what a, a, a strong stakeholder manager will do all along is look for ways to align the values among their stakeholders. And this often involves having creative third-way solutions uh, rather than skip straight to trade-offs. Now, I don't want to imply by this that trade-offs are never necessary because of course that is not true. Uh, at some point we do occasionally have to make decisions that uh, uh, damage some people's uh, well-being. Um, th the main point I'm trying to make here is that skipping to those trade-offs too quickly as a default because we think we know what our uh, objective function because we think that those just are our values. So right now we're seeing some of this creativity around the world and I and uh, I think that we will be hearing more and more about how less than General Motors sized businesses have uh, have adapted to this scenario. But of course, we see uh, uh, automakers trying to figure out how to make ventilators. Uh, we see whiskey distillers figuring out how to make hand sanitizer. And these are obviously creative solutions that will keep uh, some people uh, on board. More recently, I've been hearing instead of laying off large parts uh, of, of the workforce, I've been hearing increasing examples of take one week per quarter off or maybe one day every week or every two weeks. And in a way, this sort of spreads the pain around a little bit more evenly, I suppose, rather than laying off. And, and for those of you, just in case there are other scholars or academics out in the audience, um, I have seen the future, the University of Arizona, uh, is reducing faculty salaries by between 17 and 20 percent. So lest we think that uh, uh, the ivory tower is safe from some of this pain sharing, uh, uh, we, it will be interesting to see. Now, of course, in the same way that we see donations from Jeff Bezos, you know, 100 million dollars, and uh, we want to compare that to his total wealth, of course, to see if he has shared enough of our pain. Uh, it is noteworthy that University of Arizona's endowment is about one billion dollars. Uh, and so I can imagine, uh, you know, why do we have endowments? Why do we have rainy day funds? It doesn't get much rainier than this, but that's a bit of a digression. Um, I'm going to come in I, here, Robert, if you don't mind, um, because uh, I wanted to just kind of, we, we, we're dealing with a crisis, of course, which is, which is uh, on everybody's mind. 
I'm just wondering with a bigger picture shift, which we, we seem to get signaled just before the crisis with a business roundtable statement signed by 181 CEOs of the biggest companies. I mean, that was basically a declaration to say we recognize that we operate for, shareholder, for stakeholders and not only for shareholders. It only came, you know, whatever it was, 25 years late uh, after 1984 when Ed Freeman introduced the concept. So I just wonder how seriously you take that statement. Did that, is that a real shift or is that just a little bit of, of uh, convenient marketing? I'm, I'm reasonably confident. So we, we, uh, 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 we've done a, a piece for the uh, Journal of Management reflecting on uh, those principles. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it's out yet, but, but it did give us a, a moment to think about this. And, and the truth is, uh, on the one hand, uh, there was always a diversity of leadership among those, uh, among those leaders. Uh, and, and so I, I suspect that some of them are just reasserting what they were already doing. For some of them, it is window dressing. Perhaps to me, one of the more interesting points about that document uh, is that it uh, rings the death knell of shareholder wealth maximization as a legal requirement. Unless you assume that uh, all of these CEOs put their names on something like this without running it through their corporate uh, attorneys, uh, then assuming that they did, I have to assume that, uh, that, that legal got at least a brief look at this that the idea that you have a legal obligation to maximize shareholder wealth died that day, unless you don't believe the uh, entire legal team uh, of, of 180 of the largest corporations in the world. Uh, right. so, so that's my sort of brief reflection. There's the, of course, more to say about that as well. Okay, thank you. We'll bring you back into the discussion, of course, when we open it up, but I'd like to go to Jed now, uh, Jed Emerson, uh, because Everything to do with, uh, with capital and money is certainly no, no stranger to you. So let me begin with an introduction. So Jed Emerson spent the past four decades exploring diverse uh, aspects of value creation and positive impact via corporations, social enterprises, and capital markets. And uh, presently is a strategic advisor to leading impact investor family offices and investment firms. He's held faculty appointments at Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford Business Schools. In the late 1990s, he led the first team to formalize a methodology to track social return on investment, and he introduced the concept of blended value in 2000. And Jed, your latest work focuses on exploring the history, purpose, and future of capital. So uh, shareholder value is all about capital. Uh, how is blended value different, and where did it come from? I think they're both the same in the sense that uh, all of this, this whole conversation, as you so nicely teed up, uh, has a, a historical background to it. And I think as a part of that, we need to recognize that all of these ideas are grounded in social and cultural constructs for how people at different periods of time have understood the nature of value. And I think that we tend to... Uh, uh, again, speaking of our own ignorance, because we don't know this often, we enter the conversation either professionally or in the course of one's life, uh, very excited about discovering ideas that actually are fundamental to the human experience. And I think when we talk about value, that's really at, at core what we're talking about is how different cultures and communities, different generations have understood the nature of the value that they seek to create over the course of a life. I'll make two comp uh, observations up front. So therefore, the fact that on this panel, uh, we're not benefiting uh, from uh, our, our female colleagues, we're not benefiting from indigenous uh, perspectives, but we're not benefiting from uh, perspectives from the global south, I think will have an effect on how we understand the nature of value. And so we need to call that out, I think, right up front as really a limitation uh, for the lens that we bring to this conversation. Uh, in my case, I come out of the, I started my career in social work, and we were very clear that we were the good guys and the business community was the bad guys. Uh, and the, the dominant practice really was, uh, especially at that time, uh, what you described in terms of the Connergies and the Rockefellers and 
you know, those who came after them in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, where the practice really was uh, what could be thought of as uh, rape, pillage, and philanthropy, uh, where there was a disconnect uh, between how you made your money and what you then went to do with those, that money. And uh, I came into the conversation and into this community in the 90s, where I, uh, for 11 years, ran a fund uh, with George Roberts, who's one of the founding partners of KKR, where we were taking philanthropic capital and investing it in market-facing companies that were owned by nonprofits seeking to employ formerly homeless people. And so we were right in the middle of this uh, tension between, you know, quote, do well and do good. And I think that there was a generation of us who came up during that period, uh, the folks who were involved in the, in the US, and there was a, a version of this going on in Europe at the same time. But in the US, the practices were driven out of communities of people like Social Venture Network and Investor Circle. And um, basically what you could think of as kind of mission motivated entrepreneurs and investors. And across from them were venture philanthropists and strategic philanthropists uh, nonprofit social entrepreneurs. And what happened, I think, was toward the end of the 90s, you saw this coming together where a group of folks recognized that they were all talking about what, to my mind, was fundamentally the same thing, uh, which is a vision of value that is whole and integrated. And yet, each of us in our own silos was struggling with the limitations of a bifurcated value proposition that asked you to either make a grant or make an investment. It asked you to either work in a nonprofit or a for-profit. Uh, it said that uh, the organizational structures and the leadership approaches uh, really should be different because the motivations were thought to be different. And yet all of us were struggling with the limitations of a bifurcated value proposition. And so in the late 90s, I began to say that instead of focusing on the investment a vehicle or delivery mechanism, instead of thinking in terms of a grant or an investment, a nonprofit or a for-profit, what we needed to do is step back and revision our understanding of the value that we sought to create in the world, and then look at what were the best mechanisms, tools, and techniques that we could use and mobilize in order to advance that value. And to my mind, value is fundamentally whole and non-divisible it, it has component parts of economic, social, and environmental elements, the, the triple bottom line, if you will, but that, that triple bottom line needs to be viewed as fully whole and integral, and that in the absence of that, you end up with this set of trade-offs that actually limit your ability to optimize and capture the value you seek in the world. So, Jed, if I could ask you then, firstly, uh, I think you've given us the the explanation, but in a, in a one sentence, what is blended value? But more interesting in a way, you know, you've had quite a, an impact through social return on investment as a, almost an approach or a method, uh, and also getting into the whole area of impact investing. So is impact investing, uh, you know, all it's cracked up to be? Is it having a big impact? Uh, is, it, is it still marginal? Maybe you could just say a few words on that. Well, at its best, impact investing is in essence the, the capitalization of blended value. And uh, the organizations, the companies, whether nonprofit or for profit, that capital moves into uh, are again, I think, pursuing blended value, whether or not people use these terms. This is how I understand you know, what's happening in the world, if you will. When we get into the conversation around impact investing, to my mind, we talk about total portfolio management. We, I work with ultra high net worth families and when we develop capital allocation and deployment strategies, we are looking at uh, all of their assets. We're looking at philanthropic, near market and market rate capital and saying across that continuum, uh, what is the risk return and impact profile of any given investment vehicle or strategy? And then reflect on that from the asset owner's perspective with regard to the nature of the value that that family seeks to create in the world. And I would argue that some variation of that for better or worse 
is at play for all fiduciaries, uh, whether institutional or family office or what have you, and that this is the social conversation that we're engaged in, is that uh, we know now that if we simply do traditional financial analysis, we will miss many things that could be viewed as, quote, off balance sheet. Uh, so for example, for years, petroleum companies were highly valued uh, because of the amount of oil that they had in the ground. Uh, in a world where that oil is actually destroying culture and community and environment, uh, those assets become stranded and actually are off balance sheet risks. And so it's a different way of understanding the nature of the value that we seek to create and the resources we have to do so. All right, thanks, Jed. Um, and I'll just note to the other panelists that uh, some questions are coming in on the chat, so keep an eye on that. You'll have a chance to come back and, uh, and give your answer on some of those. But now I'd like to move to Stuart Hart and to introduce uh, Stuart. He's a professor and Stephen Grossman Distinguished Fellow is in Sustainable Business at the University of Vermont's Grossman School of Business and co-founder of the school's Sustainable Innovation MBA program. Bloomberg Business Week has described him as one of the founding fathers of the base of the pyramid economic theory. He's also the founder of Enterprise for a Sustainable World and the BOP Global Network. His over 100 articles and nine books have received more than 40,000 Google Scholar citations. And his best selling book, Capitalism at the Crossroads, is among Cambridge University's top 50 books on sustainability of all time. So, welcome, Stuart. Um, I mean, your concept of, of sustainable value, where did that come from? Um, we mentioned in the introduction there BOP, bottom of the pyramid which came just before it. So I guess uh, it also built on that work that you did with uh, CK Prahalad. So where did it come from? What is it? Yeah, well, Wayne, thank you. Uh, and uh, good to be with everyone. Yeah, for me, the, the thinking on this kind of emerged uh, starting in the mid nineties, but it actually kind of goes back further than that, you know, to more like 35 years ago. I joined the faculty at the University of Michigan in the Business School in 1985. And, you know, now, now with the uh, benefit of retrospect, can see what was happening at the time, which was the, t the ideological takeover of business schools by the shareholder value methodology and perspective. And so I, I was a strategy, young, wet behind the ear strategy professor. I watched that happen. Uh, was teaching strategy. Increasingly, the strategy courses were steered in that direction. I, I because of my, my background in the 70s was, you know, I'm a, a master's degree from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, teaching strategy in business schools. So I, you know, I, I kept trying to bring this perspective in without too much success. Uh, and it was only in the 90s that windows began to open. So uh, so it started with the recognition that shareholder value, you know, is more than just driving, you know, kind of earnings per share and quarterly earnings. It's more multidimensional. We know that from balanced scorecard. Wayne, if you bring up that that uh, slide, uh, you know, so it's it started realizing, you know, as you as you think more deeply about it, that uh, that shareholder value is actually a multidimensional concept, right? That uh, it requires you to do more than just uh, drop short-term earnings to the bottom line. You know that there's the, there's an internal aspect of building capabilities in order to you know kind of drop value to the bottom line. That's the lower, lower left quadrant. Uh, but uh, but then you also have to think about other dimensions. You have to think about not only about managing today's business effectively, but also how you manage how you grow tomorrow's business at the same time. You have to think about internal competencies, but you also have to think about external perspectives, and often those those things can be in conflict. So I, I realized, you know, as as sort of the '90s emerged, that there was not only was shareholder the idea of shareholder value a multidimensional construct, but as more and more perspectives came forward about what we'll call sustainability, because in the early '90s that was not yet a, a well-known buzzword in the business world. Uh, that there were all of these different perspectives, right? That that sustainability is tr is tribal, right? That people are preaching different elements and different dimensions and different constructs of sustainability. So I was my my motivation then, starting in the mid '90s, was to, you know, can can I figure out how 
these various elements that are emerging about sustainability in business, how might those relate constructively to the generation and drive of shareholder value in all of its dimensions? So you put up this, this first lower left quadrant, which I think was the one that emerged first, you know, in the, in the late 80s and 90s around pollution prevention. Uh, it, it should be obvious why that happened because it was, it, it, it was what produced the quickest short-term returns. So that, that got traction very quickly beginning in the early 90s. That, you know, from a corporate payoff shareholder value point of view, it's about cost and risk reduction in today's business. And pollution prevention, at least in some cases, delivered that, right, in terms of minimizing waste and emissions from operations. So that, that took off, right, that as one construct, as one tribal group around continuous improvement, around eco-efficiency. And, of course, uh, we, may be, we may be reaching the uh, limits of that, right, in terms of diminishing returns. But I think that's been a prominent strategy for some time. But then next, you know, I think what, what really emerged was what, what I'll call product stewardship, which was more than just minimizing waste and operating efficiently in, you know, company facilities. It, it really kind of reached out and you think about the entire value chain, you know, upstream to all the way to where raw materials come from, downstream product and use, end of life, and all of the stakeholders that are engaged in that. So I think here there's a strong connection with the idea of, of stakeholder theory and how to integrate those stakeholder views, uh, but then to also realize that, that there are important implications for uh, life cycle thinking, for product design, for green supply chains, for design for environment, for product take back, right? That, that product stewardship you know, is, is a kind of a distinctive strategy unto itself, and if done well, can really help drive reputation, legitimacy, differentiation, and so forth. So for that reason, under the right set of circumstances, it can be a value driver, right? But, but for different, on different dimensions than pollution prevention, right? It's a, it's a different strategy. Uh, but then, you know, it became pretty clear that just sort of driving value in today's business isn't nearly enough, right? If as a company, your objective is to be in business for the long term, you have to be constantly growing tomorrow's capabilities, tomorrow's businesses, uh, it's not, you know, first perform today and then worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. These have to be done simultaneously. So it became clear this in the, this idea of clean technology is really about growing tomorrow's competence for creating tomorrow's businesses. It's about ra radical innovation. It's about building new competencies. Uh, and the payoff there has to do with innovation and repositioning for the future. That if you just kind of milk today's competencies, you eventually fly that plane into the ground. Uh, and so clean tech, a distinctive strategy with a very different shareholder value logic than pollution prevention or product stewardship. And then lastly, you know, the, if you think more externally, because often companies can be R&D intensive, can be great, you know, kind of generators of technology, but are never able to really match that with market creation or market opportunity. Uh, you know, it became increasingly clear that this idea, you know, we'll call it new market space, this is where the work on base of the pyramid really came from, that you have unmet needs, underserved markets, uh, and that equally important to product stewardship, which has to do with thinking about the entire life cycle and current products, there's an opportunity space around new market creation where you co-create new business models for those unmet needs, right? That has to do with disruption, with new business models, with building new eco uh, collaborative ecosystems in order to serve those unmet needs. And the payoff there has more to do with growth and future traje trajectory in terms of driving shareholder value, because that's important too. So that, this is where the idea of this framework came from, that it's a, it's a portfolio really, and, and that every corporation, especially public corporations, uh, have a portfolio. In other words, they are, they're, you, you can see their level of effort on those different sort of four constructs of sustainability strategy. And the question is, what's the right portfolio? Yeah, and Stuart, you often talk about this being uh, something like a great leap forward. Uh, just explain to us what you mean by that and why you characterize it that way. We all talked about the green leap, you know, yeah. The, the, yeah, the green leap. And there the idea was after having kind of worked with a variety of companies, you know, o over the years, kind of applying this framework, what became evident, and I think it's still true, tragically, although this is changing, is that most incumbent firms are bottom heavy on that framework. Right? In other words, they, they're, they're pretty strongly engaged with pollution pre prevention and increasingly with product stewardship. 
but you know, tend to have only minimal investments around creating tomorrow's competencies, you know, in terms of inherently clean and regenerative technology, or you know, kind of opening up and creating tomorrow's markets, especially in the underserved space. So that the typical portfolio is bottom heavy. And it, you know, it seemed to me now going back 20 years that the future lies, you know, in figuring out how it's not that you give up or abandon the bottom part of the matrix. You can't if you're an incumbent firm. But it seemed to me that there was a driving need for more investment in the top part of that matrix. And that that's what I thought about as the green leaf. Great. Thanks, Stuart. We'll bring you back in uh, as we go into the general discussion. Um, uh, I'd like to bring in Mark Kramer now, who's a leading researcher, writer, speaker, and consultant on strategies for social impact, including moving beyond ESG towards impact investment and systems change. Uh, Mark, you're best known as co-author of the seminal articles on creating shared value with Michael Porter in Harvard Business Review and collective impact with uh, John Kenia in Stanford Social Innovation Review. Um, you founded FSG with uh, Professor Michael Porter and served as managing director for this 150 person global social impact consulting firm, which also supports the shared value initiative among other networks and you're a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School. So um, tell us a little bit of where this has come from. Uh, shared value, you've obviously, uh, did we lose? We seem to have, yes, no, we're fine. So Mark, uh, shared value, you worked with Michael Porter on this. Um, how, how do you describe it? What is it? Uh, how is it the same or different to other things that we've been sharing? And uh, yeah. Thank, thank you, Wayne, and, and good day, everyone. And uh, it really is a pleasure and an honor to be here with, uh, with Robert and Jed and Stuart, who, uh, to whom we owe a great debt. Uh, we're rather late comers to the game. Um, I started working with Michael Porter, um, gosh, close to 30 years ago, uh, really in the area of philanthropy. Both of us had been involved in uh, charitable foundations and nonprofits, and we began to think about how do you make philanthropy more effective? What does strategy mean in philanthropy where ph philanthropists don't compete with each other? They're trying to accomplish similar goals. Uh, and that led to a body of work that led us to start uh, FSG, which originally stood for Foundation Strategy Group. Uh, along the way, we had some companies come to us. Actually, Shell was the first company that came to us to help them think about a strategy for their foundation. And we very quickly realized that the company has so much more impact on social and environmental issues than their foundation ever could have. And we began to think about uh, the role of business and society from that perspective. Uh, and then we began to bring in Porter's strategy frameworks. And I think something that we didn't do a very good job of articulating in that uh, first shared value article is how much shared value comes out of Porter's frameworks. Um, so we saw that uh, Porter's famous five forces that helps you understand profitability in industry, the five forces really are affected by social and environmental issues. If you look at a five forces analysis of uh, power, electric power utilities, or food and beverage companies. Uh, you see that changing social and environmental conditions have a huge impact on where uh, competitive opportunity lies. And so this idea of creating shared value we talked about as having three different levels. Uh, the first, uh, which is very much consistent with what Stuart was talking about in terms of uh, thinking about tomorrow, uh, and external forces is around finding new opportunities, new products, new markets. And of course, in Porter's framework, it very, comes, uh, very much comes out of the idea of competitive positioning and uh, differentiation. Uh, the second level is around increasing productivity in the value chain. And again, as we've looked at Porter's value chain frameworks, we see that every single step in the value chain both depends on certain external conditions, environmental and social conditions, and also has an effect on social and environmental conditions. And uh, the third level uh, is really about strengthening the cluster uh, or the uh, environment, competitive context, in which a company is operating. Um, and in each of these areas, we've seen that companies can be a very, very powerful actor uh, in delivering positive social and environmental benefits. And they can do it in ways that reinforce their competitive positioning. 
so one quick example, when I teach a course now on creating shared value at the business school, uh, we often start with Discovery Insurance, which is a health and life insurance company from South Africa. And they've uh, developed a very sophisticated set of incentives that lead their clients to actually engage in healthier behavior. They exercise more, they eat better, and as a result, they have about 15% lower healthcare costs. They have about a 10 year longer life expectancy. We've had studies from Johns Hopkins and others confirming this effect. And it's really rethinking the nature of insurance from saying it's merely about spreading risk to saying, wait a minute, insurance companies can actually create incentive models that change risk, that reduce risk, and therefore create a more profitable model. And so what we've seen in many different industries is that the, the industry was developed and competitive positions were taken at a time when people thought social and environmental impacts didn't matter, weren't relevant. But today they are relevant. And companies like uh, Coca-Cola or Duke Energy or others have a challenge they have to either rethink their business model based on what we know today about the environment, about nutrition, et cetera, and find a new competitive positioning. Or in many cases, they're just trying to hold off change by lobbying against regulation and trying to persuade consumers that these things aren't real. And of course, that's a losing battle. Uh, so the way we think of creating shared value is really about a competitive strategy that takes into account social and environmental impacts as a source of differentiation, greater profitability. Okay. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad you brought in environmental at the last minute as well, because one of the perceptions could be that uh, shared value is only talking about social and economic uh, win wins. Um, do, you, do you also see in the model that there is? an acknowledgement that it's not always a win-win, that actually there can be destruction of value as well, or in fact, there can be trade-offs. So yes, we create this, this shared value on this part of our business, but actually in the meantime, we're destroying a different kind of value in another part. Yes, and um, first of all, I should say that we um, got a little tired of repeating social and environmental every time we talked about an impact. <laughs> And we've tried to just talk about social impacts, uh, but we certainly mean to include environmental impacts in that. Environmental impacts are, do have social consequences. Um, so we were never trying to uh, avoid environmental impact. Shared value is very much about win-win. Uh, we're always careful to say, you know, it's not the same as corporate social responsibility. Companies still do have an obligation to minimize uh, and mitigate the negative externalities that they create. That's not always a win-win. It is sometimes a question of uh, regulation and sometimes a question of prudence. Um, and so we do think of shared value as being mostly win-win situations. In, in my experience, uh, the win-lose situations are often trying to retrofit business models to take into account environmental or social obligations and regulations without really rethinking the business model. And shared value, ideally, is about rethinking the business model to find profitable opportunities based on what we know today about the importance of social and environmental impact. So you can well imagine an insurance company that has a win-lose proposition uh, around trying to minimize healthcare costs and therefore putting their consumers in a worse uh, health situation. Uh, but when you really rethink the model as Discovery did, uh, you find there are opportunities for win-win strat strategic positioning. All right, thank you. Um, some interesting questions coming on the chat, which we'll return to, uh, among others, what's the link of all of this to the SDGs? And we'll return to that as I open it out. Before we do that, I just want to introduce uh, the way that I've been framing these issues for the last uh, couple of years. My main interest is, uh, is systems thinking and are we making sure that we apply a systemic approach to uh, our thinking about value. So I'm just gonna share my screen again. Um, 
and just briefly share the model that I use. Uh, it certainly uh, builds on all the models that have come before. Um, but the way that I try to explain, in fact, even sustainable development is that it's all about looking at these very interconnected systems, the economic, social, ecological, knowledge, and human system, but especially looking at where things are systemically breaking down. And I call that disruption, which is about the shocks to the system. We're busy going through one now in the form of a pandemic. Disparity, which is a lot of social issues around discrimination and inequality. The degradation, which is the environmental piece. Disconnection, which has two faces. One, of course, there is a digital divide, which exacerbates inequality. Not everyone has access to the technology. Um, uh, but on the other hand, some uh, super connected societies now are starting to see a different kind of disconnection where the machines are replacing us. And so we get disconnected again. Uh, and then discontent, which is about uh, the lack of health and well being. And for each of these areas, there is a kind of area of the economy that is responding. And to me, this is the work of sustainability or social responsibility or value uh, creation. And uh, you get a resilience economy, which is dealing with that risk piece and ensuring that we can survive and thrive through times like these. Uh, the access economy, making sure that uh, the economy itself is more inclusive, building on concepts like uh, bottom of the pyramid uh, models and so on. The circular economy, getting to zero waste. Um, digital economy, fourth industrial revolution, internet of things and so on, and the well-being economy. And each of these creates a pathway to innovation. And to me, uh, integrated value is just the term that I use, is when you can do more than one of these things at a time. So uh, again, uh, in a way with a win-win perspective, can you, can you create a smart solution using technology that is also sustainable or a shared solution that is also satisfying? And you'll see that kind of thinking, I ref think reflected in all of the models that have been shared that, by, by all of you on the panel today uh, to try and get to that synergy, that point of, uh, of multiplying the benefits. But at the same time, we have to, we can use it as a kind of a test, uh, test list, if you like, to say, well, if we're creating value that makes us more secure here, but at the same time, we're destroying the, uh, the planet, then that's an, probably an unacceptable trade-off, or at the very least, we need to have a conversation about those trade-offs. So just throw, throwing that into the discussion. Um, now I'd like to open it out a bit and uh, first just give an opportunity to any of the panelists to respond to what you've heard and also what, uh, what's been posted on the chat. And Jed's uh, quickest on the draw, so we'll start with you, Jed. <laughs> well, first off, I loved all the comments. This was really interesting. And the question I have for all of us is, what are the, the true, are, are there true limits? And if we think about a systems frame, where do you draw, quote, boundaries? Um, I can see, quote, win-win scenarios. I can see kind of stakeholder interest activities where for a small set of actors, it, it, you know, you're win-win, but if you expand your definition of the boundary, it's still not addressing true systems change. It's still not addressing fundamental inequities uh, in the world. And it's still not truly, quote, sustainable. And so I'm curious to hear people's perspective on kind of like, is any of this really ultimately good enough? Um, I mean, when we look at coronavirus and how it just kind of blew through boundaries uh, and also lifted up. The, the real disparities in, in race and class, at least in the United States, uh, I wonder if, uh, if this is any of this, when uh, push comes to shove, is good enough for what needs to happen. Great question. Thanks, Jed. Of course, everything's a nested system, right? So you can create value at one part of the system and destroy it another part. Stu? Yeah, and Jed, I think that's really a key question, right? And it, it, it strikes me, you know, as I sort of sit here now, uh, uh, quarantined that uh, in some ways this this like I suppose we could call it a movement over the last you know 30 years or so uh, was a response to the the emergence and domination of neoliberalism and market fundamentalism right that that really happened in the late starting in the late 70s and into the 80s uh, you know as I as I referred to in the 
at the start of my comments. And, you know, so I think for the last 30, 40 years, it's been, at least from an American perspective, right? I mean, it's, it's different in other parts of the world. The, the expectation that government was going to take a, a leadership role just was an illusion, right? And I, I, so I really think that what's going on now, you know, with COVID-19 just blows all that apart, right? And uh, I, I don't think it's going to come back together. We're not going to go back to the way it was. I think in many ways, this is, even though it's horrible, a really opportune time because we're, we're going to desperately need a, uh, you know, an engaged, positive, proactive government in, in order for any of this to really work, right? Now, so I think you're right. I mean, there's, there's no way that just individual company actions were ever going to be sufficient. Uh, and so it's, it's high time now that we, we blend that with, you know, kind of forward leaning government as well in, in, in order to create a system that has a chance of being sustainable long term. I, I would just echo that. I, I, I think uh, you, you can't uh, have a just and sustainable society without good government. And good government is unfortunately an extremely rare commodity, uh, not just in the US, but in the world. And uh, it can't, companies can do a lot, but they can't do enough uh, without government behind it. I completely agree. You know, I'll also say we found that there are shared value opportunities in sort of unexpected places where we wouldn't first have expected. So we did a report on uh, the competitive advantage of racial equity in the United States, uh, looking at how companies that have typically ignored um, uh, populations of color uh, and not designed either their employment circumstances or their products and services uh, to meet the needs of those populations, uh, are actually missing tremendous economic opportunity by not doing so and, and found interesting examples where uh, companies have improved um, the productivity, reduced turnover costs dramatically uh, by shifting to much greater sensitivity and racial sensitivity and equity uh, in their employment practices. Thank you. And I suppose that mine is a plea for humility, I guess. I, I want to I want to have some success in what I strive to do. And, and I'm, I think that while business is able to expand its responsibilities, as we've been seeing in some organizations, um, it's almost too much to ask for a lot of companies. Not all, you know, if you're in the Fortune 100 and you have, uh, and you have balance sheets the size of GDPs, then perhaps what you're describing uh, is a more viable opportunity. But for the, the fast run of businesses, uh, if we can do our shop more ethically and more sustainably and more equitably, um, <clears throat> that's a good day's work to me. Okay. I'm going to invite uh, Jan to come in and just share a little bit of what's been going on in the chat. Uh, any themes that you see coming out there or, or questions you think were particularly interesting? Yeah, thanks, Wayne. Um, some questions are already raised and also answered by the panelists. We have approximately three teams and topics that came across also in the preparation and the questions that the registrations uh, came through. One is about the future of value creation and also that we hear and read that our company is trying to evolve from a do no harm towards a do better uh, aspect. Uh, we live with a lot of challenges reflected in the SDGs. So what are the best ways to make trade-offs, to prioritize, to link towards those SDGs? That's one. Uh, second is more on barriers and opportunities to implement the value creation concepts that we talked about. One specific question was also on how do you see the impact of government administration, such as the Trump's administration, to roll out the respectable uh, initiatives that companies take worldwide? Is the solution for everything, a responsible and proposed driven leadership. Um, and then more reflected towards uh, small and medium sized companies, how are they are dealing with that? Uh, because they, how can they uh, become from a short term perspective to a longer term perspective? And then the last broader topic is about the alignment between the concepts. So when you talked about the integrated value approach, but how can the concept get more aligned uh, Mark or has it already responded to a question, do we need both CSV and CSR? Uh, the, is CSV uh, supersede CSR? And how to align or combine concepts that we talked about? So these are the three overall teams that we see here. 
Thanks, Jan. Uh, good uh, comments and questions. Uh, certainly, I'm for one for saying we, we're not looking for a super unified theory of everything and that, uh, you know, whichever concepts and models work in a particular context, uh, if they're useful, they should be used. Um, there is certainly overlap and this, but I think also each comes from a, a different angle. Um, and I, I just wanted to, in a way, come back to, to what Jed raised, which is, you know, how do we know when value creation or destruction is, is crossing a threshold? Are we really going to rely on governments to say this much and no more? That seems to have been our assumption in capitalism until now, that governments will tell us when we've exceeded the boundaries, but we know that that's been completely abused and the bigger companies get, the more they're able to abuse it. Uh, whereas now we have a movement of science-based targets and so on, um, a lot of the value creation uh, approaches we're talking about are still just putting the the power to define value and the limits of value in the hands of companies and to say, well, yes, we created this much value by doing this and that, but aren't there certain thresholds beyond which it's no longer acceptable? Uh, you know, if you look at value to society as a measure, uh, you can show financially, this is how much economic value we've created, how much social value we've created, and oh, by the way, we're destroying environmental value but the value we're creating for the economy and society is much bigger, so maybe we shouldn't be worried about ecological value destruction. And of course, that's a total misunderstanding of, of systems theory. So I'm just interested to, to get the panelists' views on any of those themes that were raised, or indeed, you know, how do we get to something where we start to uh, have this as a little bit more of a sharper tool rather than a, a way just to to claim value creation. Anybody want to kick off on that? Well, I, I can say, I mean, I think um, we are all talking about very similar overlapping in nearly identical things in many ways uh, with slight differences. But um, the big issue I find is whether business leaders and for that matter business school students uh, understand that social and environmental issues are a part of the business equation and not something that is on the side or that is a cost uh, to be minimized or avoided and there is this mindset shift that i think is the most fundamental one uh, to really recognize and coronavirus is a you know <laughs> extraordinary example you can't have successful businesses in a failing economy where there is disease, where there is environmental harm, where there is social harm. Uh, and you can't have a healthy society uh, without competitive, profitable businesses that generate uh, wages and taxes and philanthropy and everything else. Um, and so it's really, but we come out of a, of a time where people really believe that the two were antagonistic, that if you were doing something good in the world, uh, you couldn't be serious about making money. And if you were serious about making money, you couldn't pay attention to whether the consequences were good or bad. And uh, that is no longer a reality, but there are an awful lot of people who still have that mindset. And right. to me, the fundamental shift uh, to make the systemic change you're talking about, Wayne, is this shift in mindset. Okay. We've got about five minutes left, and uh, I can see that we have things to say, but we're going to have to say them briefly. So I'm going to give each of the panelists a chance just to give a concluding response or, or thought. Um, and it's, we'll go in the order, I think, in which the hands uh, came up. So uh, Robert Phillips first, and then Stu. Uh, I don't have so much by way of concluding remarks as, uh, as a question, so you have to sort of take your shot when, it's, uh, when you're open. Uh, so, so Mark, you mentioned uh, that you, you feel as though Porter's Five Forces uh, really was uh, the, the grounding for this. And, and something I've always wondered, it strikes me that the original Five Forces are remarkably competitive with regard to stakeholders. It's, you know, it, it's, it, it always felt to me a little zero sum. I'm sure you've had some occasion to think about the relationship between competition and cooperation among stakeholders with respect to CSV. So again, I don't want to uh, absorb your concluding remarks time uh, as well as my own, but, uh, but if you had some, a moment or two on that, I, I must confess curiosity. 
We'll come back to that in a moment, uh, Mark. Let's go to Stu. Yeah, uh, also not so much a concluding comment as just some thoughts. Uh, a number of the uh, participants have raised the question about the SDGs. And, uh, and it, it strikes me that the, SD, the SDGs, I think, are extremely useful, but, but can also be, be, because of the volume, you know, <laughs> the 17 big goals and 100 and some odd sub goals and targets, can be a little daunting you know, for, for people and companies. And so I think the one, maybe the one caveat is it's easy for companies to kind of treat the SDGs in a form of neo-compliance way, you know, where, you know, you delegate, all right, so go figure out which of these we're hitting on, you know, and then we can say we, you know, we're addressing goal three, five, and seven, put that in our sustainability report and we're done. Uh, so I think there's a real, real danger there that it ends up being just a form of neo-compliance. But I think there are companies that have been able to kind of grab a hold of the SDGs and really internalize them in such a way that, you know, if you, if you really, I mean, it's kind of long to read them all, but if, you, if you're able to kind of really absorb what's in the SDGs and then incorporate that into a process of creative thinking about how companies can either leverage their current competencies or folk, use it as a focus for growing new ones, the SDGs can be a real source of create, creative thinking about how to how to create sustainable value. That, that I think is the highest and best use. Great, thanks Stu. Um, we will come to Jed next for a concluding comment and then we'll end with Mark. Well, I, I would just like to kind of pick up on both Robert and Mark's comments. Uh, Robert, in regard to humility, Mark, in terms of mind shift, uh, I think one of the big opportunities that we all have is to really step back ourselves personally and reflect in a different way about the limitations that we bring to our own practice. Uh, um, I think that there are so many embedded biases, uh, cultural orientations that inhibit us from actually redefining uh, the role and place of companies as well as capital. Uh, my last book, The Purpose of Capital, uh, which I am promoting because it's free at purposeofcapital.org, you can get a digital version um, really says, look, I, you know, I did seven books on the tactics and the strategies and ultimately realized that what's, quote, wrong with this conversation is that all of that is about the how. And each of us individually must re-engage in a much deeper way with the why. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to understand which tool, tactic, and approach works for who we are and how we understand the world. And that we have this great opportunity to reinvent not just the world, but ourselves in the process of that pursuit. And so I would encourage us each to go deeper in ourselves and not settle for the easy answers. Great, thanks. And Luke on chat saying uh, maybe it's a heart shift more than a mind shift. So final word, uh, 60 seconds for you, Mark. Well, I'll just uh, quickly respond to Robert's comment. I think that the, uh, the five forces is very zero sum in the sense that all of the different players in an industry are trying to capture as much of the value as possible and they take it away from others. But what Porter would say is the way to optimize your profit and sustain it is to find a niche, to find a particular uh, customer segment whose needs you can meet uniquely well and customize your value chain to meet those needs. And that there's an infinite number of competitive positionings available in any given industry because there's an almost infinite number of customer needs to be met and differentiation. And so while the five forces is itself zero sum, the way around that is through differentiation to create greater opportunities for value for specific customer segments. And that is not at all zero sum. That is a new opportunity. And that's very much where we see the idea of creating shared value. Great. All right, we're going to bring it to a close there. Uh, I would just uh, mention that we close this session, but we then open our second session. And there is a, most of you, I think, uh, on the call have already registered for that. But for those who haven't, we'll be posting a link here on the chat uh, that you can quickly register and go into that session. That session will start in 10 minutes time. So it just uh, uh, remains for me to thank all of our extraordinary uh, set of panelists. Thank you, I, I realize we're only just scratching the surface here uh, and starting to, to find out more about uh, how these different concepts of value creation, 
complement uh, and uh, stimulate each other. And we certainly need probably more time to go in more depth. And this probably won't be the last of the round tables that we organize. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for attending. And we'll see many of you, I'm sure, in the next session, which starts at uh, 10 past the hour on the separate uh, link. Thank you all and wish you well for the rest of your day. Thank you to the panelists.